Welcome to the second lecture from our AHI class on Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan, The Making of an American Century. At the end of our first lecture, we noted Franklin Roosevelt's role in the Democratic National Conventions of the 1920s, the point being especially that he remained a significant figure in the National Party even after the terrible beating suffered by the presidential ticket on which he ran in 1920 and even after he contracted polio a year later and became partly disabled as a result. Tonight, I will say a bit more about his rise to national prominence, including Roosevelt's governorship of New York from 1929 through 1932, and then cover the first three months or 100 days of his presidency, 1933, one of the most significant periods of such brief length in American history. Roosevelt had memorably demonstrated at the 1924-1928 Democratic National Conventions, packed with large and small political players, that he had partially overcome his polio and could walk courageously, that he had partially overcome his polio and could walk courageously and cheerfully, although with much assistance, to the podium. In addition to speaking on Al Smith's behalf at these conventions, he was the floor manager at both of them as well. Smith lost the nomination in 1924, but won it four years later. However, the New York governor, who was closely identified with the city and to a much greater extent than Franklin Roosevelt was, proved a weak candidate in the 1928 election at a time of such general prosperity. Rural, socially conservative, and anti-Catholic Democrats in the South and elsewhere abandoned the party's ticket and it lost badly. In contrast, Roosevelt would have a strong appeal, especially in his first two presidential campaigns, to rural and southern Democrats, not just the urban and northern working class. Smith's 1928 nomination for president opened up the governorship, and the Republicans had a strong candidate from New York City. Democratic leaders in the state believed Roosevelt was their best chance of holding the governorship, and both Tammany Hall and upstate figures in the party tried to get him to run. Their interest in Roosevelt was due not only to what they expected would be his popularity in a statewide race, but also to the fact that he had by this time no enemies to speak of in the state's Democratic Party. Over the years, he had been effective in mending fences with Tammany people while retaining good upstate connections. Roosevelt seemingly didn't wish to run for governor, pleading that he wanted more time to continue his partial recovery from polio. But the state convention nominated him anyway, after he hesitated when Governor Smith asked him if he would refuse to campaign if nominated. Smith and other political players had resourcefully taken his hesitation in this phone conversation as a yes. That evening, following the fateful chat, the manager of the inn at Warm Springs, where Roosevelt had spent much of the last two years, asked if he was going to run. Kurt, Roosevelt replied, when you're in politics, you've got to play the game. Roosevelt's underdog 1928 campaign for governor was, in a sense, a statewide version of his intensive campaigns as the vice presidential nominee in 1920 and for the state senate in 1910. He went everywhere in the state, no matter how small the town was, and in some cases is reported to have spoken 14 times in one day. It was not easy for a crippled man to carry on this kind of campaign. His new policy aide and future presidential advisor and speechwriter Sam Rosenman later recalled, he could not climb stairs, and often we had to carry him up some back stairs to a hall and down again. He always went through this harrowing experience smiling. He never got ruffled. Having been set down, he would adjust his coat, smile, and proceed calmly to the platform for his speech. Francis Perkins now liked Roosevelt as a politician. In particular, his stamina and good humor impressed her. Roosevelt ended up winning the governorship, even though the outgoing governor, Al Smith, lost New York in the presidential race. In a late-night upset, he defeated the Republican gubernatorial candidate by 25,000 votes, thanks to an especially strong showing in the upstate areas. He took office in Albany, a familiar environment to him, due especially to his previous time in the legislature, at the beginning of 1929, less than a year before the stock market crash that was followed by the Great Depression. Merely being the governor of New York, the Empire State, the nation's largest state, 
was enough in that era to get a politician taken seriously as a possible presidential candidate. Roosevelt tackled a variety of public policy areas as governor as the nation sank into the Depression. Among these were the public provision of electric power, agriculture, conservation. Roosevelt was always quite interested in rural issues and needs and in the land, as well as relief payments for people hit by the bad economy. His first fireside chats were actually delivered four years before he became president during his first months as governor in 1929 when he wished to communicate directly to the people over the heads of the Republican-controlled legislature. In his four years as governor, Roosevelt established a commission to stabilize employment, the first such body in the United States, and became the first governor to endorse the idea of unemployment insurance. After his re-election in 1930, he called the legislature into special session and in his address to the legislators, spoke of a duty, as Roosevelt put it, of society acting through its government to prevent the starvation or dire want of any of its fellow men and women who try to maintain themselves, that is, support themselves economically, but cannot. He got a statewide relief agency established, the nation's first. Over the next six years, the agency assisted about 5 million people, or 40% of the state's population. Roosevelt's capturing of the Democratic nomination in 1932 is worth a brief discussion before we touch on his general election campaign and then discuss the first months of his presidency. Although there were other possible nominees, he had no clear opponent in the sense that primary voters and others had a simple choice between Reagan and Ford in 1976 or Obama and Hillary Clinton in 2008. Nonetheless, FDR can be said to have defeated more conservative or less ideological forces in the Democratic Party as he won the nomination and to have done so, interestingly, with much help from the South. Governor Roosevelt entered the 1932 campaign cycle, already enjoying substantial support among party stalwarts for the national nomination. An early 1931 poll of delegates and alternates who'd been at the 1928 convention showed that he was the first choice of these people in 39 of the 44 states from which responses came. Well over half of the 844 people who responded preferred Roosevelt and no competitor was even close. Polls of Democratic businessmen, bank presidents, and members of corporate boards also showed a strong lead for Roosevelt despite the pro-business reputation of Al Smith, one of the alternatives to him. It seems that the Democrats' discouragement after three consecutive presidential election losses, and by wide margins, remained powerful enough to cause much pessimism about the party's chances against President Hoover, even though the country was already in a depression or close to it. Roosevelt was considered the exception in an otherwise lackluster field of potential nominees. As a South Dakota member of the Democratic National Committee told James Farley, Roosevelt's tireless and likable chief delegate hunter, I'm damn tired of backing losers. In my opinion, Roosevelt can sweep the country, and I'm going to support him. In addition, the delegates who nominated FDR at the convention in Chicago seem to have been on board with the left-of-center approach Roosevelt was already taking toward national issues, or at least willing to accept it. It is not true that either FDR or the party's platform, which he had endorsed before it was presented to the delegates, put forth on the whole a conservative message to voters. Although it promised to reduce federal spending and balance the budget, it also called for a higher income tax, unemployment relief, extensive public works spending, flood control initiatives, aid to farmers, mortgage assistance, regulation of the securities industry, and protection for bank deposits. Much of this was also clear in Roosevelt's acceptance speech at the convention, which in addition included a harsh note of ideological advocacy against conservative Democrats, followed by a strong invitation to sympathetic Republicans to join him. Both points were prophetic of Roosevelt's political stance as president. Even in his speech at the convention, he was capable of sounding like a remarkably sore winner. I warn those nominal Democrats, he said, who squint at the future with their faces turned to the past, and who feel no responsibility to the demands of the new time, that they are out of step with their party. Ours must be a party of liberal thought, of planned action, presumably by government, of enlightened international outlook and the greatest good to the greatest number of our citizens.
Roosevelt continued, Here and now, I invite those nominal Republicans who find that their conscience cannot be squared with the groping and failure of their party leaders to join hands with us. Although he did have nearly unanimous support from Democrats in the general election, he also won the endorsement of four Republican senators, including two of the country's most prominent left-leaning or progressive political figures, California's Hiram Johnson and Nebraska's George Norris. Indeed, they endorsed Roosevelt even before he left the convention. Despite Roosevelt's arrogant and vindictive side, of which we'll see especially strong evidence a bit later in the course, his personality as a whole was perfectly suited to a national campaign and to attracting maximum political support. As his great political aide, Jim Farley, later described him, he was the, one of the most alive men I have ever met. He never gave me the impression he was tired or bored. His ability to discuss political issues in short, simple sentences made a powerful impression. There was a touch of destiny about the man. He would have made a great actor. A central feature of the 1932 campaign against President Hoover was not only the optimism Roosevelt projected much better than his opponent, but also his clear willingness to try new things in fighting the Depression. In one of his most famous pre-presidential speeches, FDR told the graduating class at Oglethorpe University in Georgia that spring, the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. The millions who are in want will not stand by silently forever while the things to satisfy their needs are within easy reach. We need enthusiasm, imagination, and the ability to face facts, even unpleasant ones, bravely. We need to correct, by drastic means if necessary, the faults in our economic system from which we now suffer. In this passage toward the end of his speech, we can see both Roosevelt's pragmatism and flexibility and, at the same time, his willingness to use what he candidly called drastic means to fight the Depression, and indeed, as he put it, to make significant changes in, quote, our economic system. Roosevelt won a landslide victory in the 1932 election, which saw the highest turnout to date at the time. He defeated Hoover by more than 7 million votes and won 42 states out of then 48. The Democrats gained 90 seats in the House, which gave them nearly a three-to-one majority. They controlled the Senate by a margin of 60 to 36. On top of this extremely favorable situation in Congress, the new president also had, of course, the massive fact of economic crisis going for him, plus a sense among many Americans, including prominent leaders, that for the time being at least, they should simply follow where the new president led. The measures Roosevelt called for in his first 100 days, would pass Congress overwhelmingly, generally with little debate and with little or almost no opposition. In this respect, as well as in the direness of the economic circumstances, it was a very rare moment in American history. Roosevelt appointed a cabinet containing two progressive Republicans, Henry Wallace and Harold Ickes, both of whom would become central figures in the left wing of his administration and would remain in it for a long time, as well as a more standard Republican, Treasury Secretary William Wooden, who didn't last nearly as long. Probably even more significant, however, was Roosevelt's attitude toward certain leaders in the Democratic Party, such as former New York Governor Al Smith, its 1928 presidential nominee and one of FDR's competitors for the 1932 nomination, Newton Baker, Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of War and still a highly respected figure in the party, and John Raskob, a former General Motors executive who had chaired the Democratic National Committee for the last few years. These relatively conservative Democrats were not given positions or apparently much input into who should fill them. In biographer Gene Edward Smith's words, all three of them, quote, represented the pro-business wing of the party, a conservative, hard-money tradition dating at least to the era of Grover Cleveland. Roosevelt, standing far to the left of this, had put together a remarkable coalition of Western populists, white Southerners, 
ethnic minorities, and big city machines. He was not about to share his victory with his rivals, nor to divert the Democratic Party from the progressive path he had staked out. In 1932, Smith continues, FDR broke the conservatives' hold on the Democratic Party and made it the instrument of liberal reform. His inaugural address on March 4, 1933, began with the declaration for which it is most famous, that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But it also included some harsh anti-business rhetoric. This great nation will endure, as it has endured, will revive and will prosper, Roosevelt predicted, adding, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Plenty is at our doorstep, Roosevelt said, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence. The money changers, he told Americans, have fled from their high seats in the temple of civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The inaugural address was also the occasion on which Roosevelt made one of the early comments that made critics and opponents at various points in his presidency speak of him as a would-be dictator. If Congress failed to act, he told his fellow citizens, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. As another recent Roosevelt biographer, historian H.W. Brands notes, if his inaugural address sounded like a war message, it fairly reflected the fact that the depression of the 1930s had done and was doing the kind of damage commonly associated with wars. It destroyed lives and livelihoods. It uprooted families and sowed despair. It blighted a whole generation. It cast a grimmer pall over America and over the American future than any development of the lifetime of Roosevelt and his generation. In another book our class has read a small selection from, Fear Itself, the New Deal, and the Origins of Our Time. Political scientist and historian Ira Katznelson stresses the difference between the fear Roosevelt cited and more ordinary worry or anxiety. In a situation that seems unlike any other, Katznelson notes, normal calculations don't work because one doesn't know if they're really applicable to such radically different and unfamiliar circumstances. Measurable risk, he explains, generates worry. Unmeasurable risk about the duration and magnitude of uncertainty spawns fear. Looking ahead, estimates of possibilities and effects grow increasingly opaque or unclear. Modeling the future becomes ever more elusive. These points would seem adequate to explain why the mood in Washington was extremely cooperative toward Roosevelt in his first hundred days especially. His first priority as president was to address the banking crisis, which he did by dubiously drawing authority from World War I emergency legislation. A law from that period called the Trading with the Enemy Act allowed the president to close banks in an emergency. Roosevelt's choice for attorney general, who died shortly before the president was inaugurated, told him what he wanted to hear, that the World War I law was still in force. FDR's other steps in the banking crisis were to issue more Federal Reserve notes to restore the nation's currency supply, backed not by gold or silver, but by the assets of the banks in the Federal Reserve System. His decision somewhat later to take the country off the gold standard will be discussed briefly next week. On March 16th, the president proposed a bill to deal with the farm crisis. Its purpose was to raise farmers' income by paying them not to produce more than an allotment, which was determined for a given crop by the Secretary of Agriculture. The funds would come from taxes on food processors, 
textile manufacturers and commodity brokers. We will see later how much taxes increase more generally in the New Deal era. The idea of the limits on production in agriculture was to raise the price of crops by reducing their supply. After the Agriculture Bill passed, Roosevelt proposed the Civilian Conservation Corps, which would eventually, in the years leading up to World War II, put more than three million young men to work for $30 a month, most of which they were required to send home to their families. The work involved planting trees, building bridges, digging reservoirs, and other outdoor activity. In addition to providing relief to the young men's families, the funds spent on constructing and running the camps provided revenues to the areas in which they were located. Eventually, there would be almost 2,500 such camps, mostly in the western half of the country. Next came major emergency relief, and what we would now call welfare, and was then often known as the dole, and public works measures as well. In his inaugural address, Roosevelt had said, our greatest primary task is to put people to work, and called for treating that task as we would the emergency of a war. The Federal Emergency Relief Agency, established by Congress, provided money to state governments to provide aid to needy people, and by the end of its first year, had assisted 17 million Americans. Roosevelt then directed his attention to the financial sector and the stock market, getting Congress to pass a bill regulating the securities industry, putting the burden of truth on the seller. Henceforth, the Federal Trade Commission would be empowered to stop new stock issues if the data they were based on was deemed defective. Those who seek to draw upon other people's money, Roosevelt said, must be wholly candid regarding the facts on which the investor's judgment is asked. The Tennessee Valley Authority, which transformed much of a poverty-stricken South, also dates from the first 100 days of the New Deal. A giant dam built at Muscle Shoals, Alabama, during World War II in order to generate electricity for the manufacture of munitions, was authorized to produce power for the region's residents, putting the federal government in the electricity business. Roosevelt then dealt with housing. The foreclosure of 273,000 home mortgages in 1932 alone, almost four times the normal rate, and the continuance of that trend in 1933 represented a crisis not only in terms of personal hardship, but also in terms of an enormous burden on banks, savings and loans, and insurance companies. To protect people from foreclosure, Congress, at Roosevelt's urging, passed legislation to refinance distressed mortgages and help homeowners pay their taxes. Repayment would be at relatively low rates. Finally, at the end of the 100 days, Roosevelt got Congress to pass the National Industrial Recovery Act, which set up the National Recovery Administration, or NRA. Industries were authorized to establish what were called production codes, which controlled prices and output, and included, for example, minimum wages and maximum hours. The NRA, which calls for detailed discussion in next week's lecture, meant, in a word, economic planning, or a large degree of centralized direction of the economy. Not only would it become unpopular among many Americans, far more so than most of what was enacted in Roosevelt's first 100 days, but much of its authorizing law, the and IRA, again, the National Industrial Recovery Act, would be invalidated two years later by a unanimous Supreme Court. In next week's lecture, we will discuss the other New Deal measures Roosevelt and Congress produced in the next several years, and more about their rationales, their results, and some of the objections made to them. Thanks for listening.